Okay, so welcome to my talk on spy radios. This is uh, designed to be sort of a hands-on talk. I'm going to talk you through some of the typical spy radios that you might find at a show like this near fest uh, and uh, show how they were used, talk a little bit about the circuitry, and then I have a number of them up here, and I'll just uh, tell you about them, and you can come up and explore them if you wish. Uh, when a country is occupied, uh, the uh, citizens of the country have really three choices. And the three choices are the citizens can choose to do nothing. That's the middle course of action here. And that's fairly typical of most of the citizens. But some of the citizens of an occupied country decide that the country that has taken over is very strong and they become collaborators with the invasion forces. And the collaborators are considered to be traitors and they end up spying on the citizens in the country and feeding that information back to the resistance, to the um, occupying forces. And uh, they also are involved in hunting for spy radios. So the collaborators, in addition to the army of the occupied country, are always looking for spy radios. And spy radios then have to be hidden quite well. And that's why they're generally miniaturized and made portable with their own power supplies. The resistance, the third group, are the patriots within the country. Uh, they be involved in active fighting. Uh, they're involved in spying on the activities within the country and feeding that information, information back to the allies. The resistance are always afraid that the collaborators are going to detect them. So not only do they have to worry about the country that they have occupied, um, the, uh, the invading forces catching them, but also they have to worry about collaborators within the country catching them. So it's a very, very scary and dangerous business. Very few of the spy radio operators survive typically a typical war. So it's very dangerous and a number of techniques which we will discuss have to be employed in order to help them survive. The radio network of the resistance is very important because it picks up information from the resistance fighters about the um, location of the enemy within the country, about the strength of the enemy troops, um, and feeds that, that information back to the allies. And that is typically done by radio. And that's where we get into spy radios. The unfortunate thing is that most of the resistance fighters within a country have no clue about how to operate a radio. And consequently, they have to be trained. And there's no time to train resistance fighters during a war. So most typically, trained radio operators are parachuted into the country. And we see down below here, trained radio operator uh, on the right. And the British typically trained clandestine spy radio operators during World War II. Uh, and Morse code, and then parachuted them into the country to operate spy radios. Uh, the obvious penalty for being caught with or operating a spy radio is death. Radio operators were nicknamed pianists because pianists play with keys and spy radio operators use Morse telegraph keys. So here is a training session for British spy radio operators to be. They have to be proficient in the Morse code. Typically, they have to be able to send and receive at 25 words per minute in order to be able to pass the course and uh, enter a, an occupied country. The spy radio operators who are going to enter a country have to be given appropriate clothing. They may choose to dress as though they are enemy soldiers, uh, in which case the British maintain a big wardrobe of uniforms, Nazi armbands, and so on. 
uh, or they may choose to be dressed as civilians. And again, the British maintained a large wardrobe of clothing for the spy radio operators to wear once they parachuted into, uh, let's say, France, an occupied country in Europe. <clears throat> the radios themselves had to be packaged very carefully for dropping. Uh, since there's a considerable shock when a package lands uh, from a parachute, even if it's well packed. And so this is a typical suitcase radio that you see here. And it is being ready for packing inside that big box-like thing that you see on the right, which is multi-layers of soft material to cushion the radio. This is a V2. British spy radio mounted in a suitcase, and they are fairly delicate, and so they had to be treated quite carefully. Uh, the spy radio operators would typically board an airplane and do a parachute drop at night into a relatively safe zone, very quickly hide their parachute and uh, find the radios, which were typically dropped separately, and uh, then set up those radios and communicate back to the Allies. In the case of uh, being dropped into France, they'd be communicating back to Great Britain. This is a typical setup in the woods with a spy a radio operator transmitting on a portable radio set. One of the more difficult challenges for the spy radio operators was to put up a good antenna system. And if you're in the woods, you can generally put up a fairly good antenna, long wire antenna typically was used, uh, just using the existing trees. But if you are located in a house, for instance, uh, and you have a clandestine radio, uh, you have to put up an antenna that's pretty hard to see. And the most typical location for an antenna was inside a chimney. And admittedly, it wasn't ideal for radiation, but it was very hard to detect. And so the spy radio operators typically would put their antennas up inside chimneys. Um, to my knowledge, they did not use the technique that many of us have used, which is to use number 30 or number 40 wire, which is virtually invisible uh, and allows you to put up a pretty good antenna virtually anywhere without a person detecting it. They use thicker wire, and I don't know why that is. I've never read about anybody, any of the spies using very fine wire at that point. So uh, the antenna was one of the ways that they could be caught, so they had to be careful that the antennas were very well hidden. There were also problems with the electric current to operate the radios. Uh, if they plugged their radios in, and the radios were designed to operate on at least four different kinds of electricity, DC 12 volts, DC 24 volts, 110 volts AC, and 220 volts AC. So they could plug them into the mains or the electrical outlets in the uh, locations where they were. But the Germans quickly learned that if they wanted to find out where a spy radio operator was transmitting from, they could go to the main power control within the city and switch off power to different blocks within the city. And when they found the point at which, or the block at which, the spy suddenly stopped transmitting, they would know that the spy radio station was located in that area. So the spies preferred not to use regular city main power and to use battery power. And if they didn't have battery power, they would use a crank generator. And you can see this is a regular automotive generator that has been hooked onto a regular bicycle and the chain from the bicycle is operating the generator. The generator is operating, generating 12 volts or six volts and the spy radio is operating on that. The spy radio operators had to receive messages to send, which they were to send by radio. And uh, typically those were done at dead drops, uh, prearranged locations where a message would be stored under a rock or uh, behind a tree or someplace. But in some cases, the messages were actually baked inside of a loaf of bread uh, or very small messages sometimes were hidden inside uh, a, a nut, a, a walnut or something of that type. 
So they had to have their messages in order to send the message. And this is a typical picture of a spy radio operator then sending a message while the set is being powered by a hand-driven generator. And this is the typical, again, B2 British spy radio, meant to look like a suitcase. Here is one of the most famous spies of World War II. Her name was Phyllis Doyle, and her code name was Paulette. And she was parachuted into Normandy before the invasion at the age of 23. And she sent half-hour coded reports and then ran away as fast as she could, knowing that she would be found by direction climbing teams within one to one and a half hours. So she had to be very careful. And you can see that she is one of the relatively few pianists who survived the war a picture of her fairly recently taken in the 1990s on the right. Uh, here she is uh, transmitting at age 23 using a British B-2 spy radio. And uh, here she is taking the components of the British spy radio that comes apart into modular components and inserting these components inside a vacuum cleaner to hide them because even being found with a component of the spy radio would be justification for the Germans to kill you. So it's very important that you hide your spy radio very well. The um, other problem with spy radios is that they were extremely heavy. You might not think that. You have a suitcase, this one for instance, built into a suitcase, looks like a relatively normal suitcase. But the problem is that in order, in those days, in order to be able to power a radio from such a wide range of voltage, 6 volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, DC, 110, 220, you needed a humongous transformer in there, really big transformer. And the transformer was very, very heavy. And so, supposedly, you can carry this suitcase. You say, well, it's just a, a suitcase full of old clothes. You're not supposed to look as though you're carrying something that weighs 60 pounds. And, and therefore, there was a problem with the female radio operators who had to carry these around because the suitcase was so heavy. Here's a radio operator with the suitcase on her hip uh, trying to make it look sort of innocent. But you can sort of tell that that is a really, really heavy suitcase. And it was very hard. A number of spy operators were actually caught because the suitcase was so extremely heavy. If you happen to be lucky enough to have a bicycle, however, you could strap your B2 radio on the back of the bicycle, as you see here, and uh, drive along and just look fairly innocent. And this is another radio operator with his B2 radio on the back of the bicycle. When you set up a radio in the woods, typically you would have a guard on duty. The man on the left is carrying a submachine gun. Uh, the two people on the right are acting as radio operators. And uh, there's a fourth person in the background hidden in the bushes. Maybe you can see him sort of looking up at the sky and checking to see if anybody's sneaking up on them. And again, the uh, radio direction finding devices were very, very highly developed. So uh, you didn't want to transmit for very long. Here's another group of spies with a hand-operated crank generator in the middle uh, with their radio set in the foreground. And uh, they are on the watch for people sneaking up on them. Obviously, if the uh, uh, Germans were to spot a group like this, they would immediately shoot them. There's no argument on that. Here is a uh, German spy <coughs> who was caught after he had parachuted into England. His code name was Tate, T-A-T-E. And the picture shows him sitting beside his radio transmitter, which is a German spy radio transmitter. And on the left, you see the code wheel that he used. The uh, spy radio operators couldn't use Enigma machines because an Enigma machine weighs as much as a spy radio. It's complicated to operate, and it would be extremely impractical to bring an Enigma machine into a country where you're operating a spy radio. Instead, they used relatively simple encryption devices, such as the code wheel on the left 
which allowed them to convert letters into numbers or other letters. Like an Enigma machine, but much simpler and easier to carry around. Double Agent Tate was caught because his controllers sent Enigma messages to other controllers telling them where he was located and telling them uh, what to instruct him to do. And of course, the Germans had no idea that the British were able to read the Enigma codes. So the British were reading the Enigma coded messages using a technique that they had learned from Polish code breakers. The Poles were the first to break the Enigma code, and then they told the British how to do it when Poland was overrun. And they, um, the British were using these techniques for reading the coded messages between spy masters about their spies. And the spy masters were giving away the location of their spies, saying, well, Tate is uh, located on uh, something or other street in London, and he's set up and he's ready to go. Well, the British simply go, and they capture Tate, and they give him a choice. You have two choices, Tate. One choice, you can refuse to cooperate with us, in which case we will hang you tomorrow. The other choice, Tate, you will send messages back to Germany using your special secret code, but the messages will be the message that we inform you what to say to, the, to your controllers in Germany. And Tate was one of the many people who decided that it would be better to cooperate with the Allies and save his life rather than to hang from the nearest tree. And that happened, in, in fact, to virtually all, I think all of the German spy operators that parachuted into um, uh, Britain, they were all caught because they never caught on to the fact that their controllers and Enigma messages were being read by the British. So the British were able to capture all of the spies that parachuted with their radios into England and surprisingly, quite a few of those spies chose to be hung rather than to collaborate with the British. Approximately, I think about 10 of them were hung uh, as spies rather than cooperating with the British. The uh, spy radio operators were also found in the United States um, from German spy radio. Hi, Mike. You're so here. Sorry, That's okay. We need you to talk about your radios a little later Thank on. You. That's okay. I'm in the middle of some Can you hang in for a few minutes? Okay. 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 Well, um, we'll come back in 10, 10 minutes. No, when we get to the radio. Okay. 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 I'll try to go fairly quickly. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Sorry. Um, the, uh, the next slide shows a German radio operator who had set himself up in New York City as a ham radio station. You can see a big helicopter speaker there in the helicopter sky, something or other radio, and, and his setup. Look under the table, you'll see some um, batteries which made it so that even in New York City, if they cut off the electricity to his spy set, uh, it wouldn't stop him from transmitting and uh, his uh, pet dog over there on the right. And here's another picture of him. And he had set himself up in the top of a building, an apartment building in New York City. And you can see the arrow points to that. So uh, German spies were setting up in various places. And again, they were caught because their spy masters were giving away their location uh, by enigma coded messages. The radio sets that were used uh, varied considerably. This is a man who invented perhaps the very first portable radio set, uh, and he was very proud of it, but it wasn't very practical. And so the next step in the invention of portable radios was the BC-611. And the BC-611 of the classic World War II walkie-talkie, we have one up here on this display. Wonderfully historic item. You can often find them at Hamfest, and uh, talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, the BC-611 was really the epitome of the military response in the war, as far as the citizens knew, because Motorola paid for a lot of ads 
I'm showing the BC611 and also happening to mention Motorola, as you see in the upper right here. A Motorola, the first handheld radio, the handy talking. So it was to Motorola's benefit to talk about these radios and show how they were contributing to the war effort. And they put out a lot of ads, both um, posters, great big posters on the wall, as well as advertisements in uh, hand magazines and even in um, public magazines like Life magazine. The uh, BC-611 was used very widely by soldiers throughout the war. We see that there were actually road signs showing soldiers using BC-611s during the war. Uh, and uh, even Earl Flynn uh, using a BC-611 <laughs> and uh, on the cover of Radio News magazine. And one that really surprised me here is Lois Lane, Superman's girlfriend at the Daily Planet with her BC-611 uh, next to the Daily Planet uh, car at that point. Even Churchill was shown with a BC-611 in his hands as, uh, what, as he watched a uh, parachute drop. BC-611 is a fascinating device. They came in many different colors and somewhat different shapes. A, a person, a soldier, who parachuted into enemy territory often carried a BC-611 along with his kit of equipment. You can see here, typical kit, four hand grenades and a 45 caliber automatic, a lot of uh, spare ammunition, a dagger with a, a brass knuckles on it, flashlight, and up there the top of a bayonet and a BC-611 with a homemade harness so it would be sort of slung over the shoulders. They didn't like the strap on the back of the BC-611 particularly. Here's a BC-611 test set. Uh, you can often find these at Hamfest. It allowed you to go through the different stages of the BC-611. BC-611 comes apart very easily, and it has a lot of various components. You can see the, the receiver up at the top that you listen to, the microphone at the bottom. The big rubber thing in the middle is a push-to-talk switch, and there is a connector on the side of certain BC-611s, which are known as the paratrooper model that allows it to be connected to an external antenna. The inside guts are very, very easily taken apart. It's beautifully modular. One of the problems with BC-611s is that it requires a 103-volt battery. And these are, those are not made anymore. But uh, in the time of World War II, you could buy those batteries. And in the surplus stores, after World War II, you could buy those batteries. Also used a couple of one and a half volt batteries. Nowadays, when you want to power up a, a BC-611, there are two ways to do it. You can get on eBay and buy a vibrator type, actually a transistorized um, power supply that runs on a three volt battery, two one and a half volt batteries, and boosts the voltage up to 103 volts. Or you can take a lot of 9-volt batteries together, about 10 9-volt batteries together, and get the right voltage. And it's kind of fun to look inside. Sometimes you, you'll pick up a BC-611 and a ham vest, and you'll find it full of a long string of 9-volt uh, batteries that somebody's uh, put together to make it work. When I was a kid, you could buy 611s with the battery pack, all operating on Radio Row in New York City for $5. And I thought that was really neat. I bought one, a friend of mine bought one. But one of the greatest disappointments of our ham radio life was that as we walked across Central Park in New York City, we found that as soon as we got about a football field apart, about 100 yards apart, you couldn't hear the other radio. I figured there must be something wrong with the radio. I retuned the uh, coils and the IF stages, still couldn't hear it. It turns out, that the military had purposely reduced the power of the transmitter dramatically after they found out that a bunch of GIs were out there in the field, in the battlefield with these radios, and they were talking about what was going on in the battlefield and without realizing that the enemy would be listening in. So the uh, BC-611 is really a very well-made 
very powerful radium, but as it comes, you find that it, its range is extremely limited. The pictures of John Wayne standing on one mountain and talking to Earl Flynn on the other mountain with the BC-611 are just completely fake. The BC-611 circuit diagram is very, very straightforward. Um, and the tubes actually operate as in two different modes, one mode in transmit and one mode in receive. So this is the RF amplifier up here on the left, uh, which is the uh, RF power amplifier for the transmitter and the RF amplifier for the receiver. Then we have the receiver converter next tube to the right, which turns out also to be the crystal controlled oscillator for the transmitter stage. Then we go to the uh, detector stage, the microphone amplifier, and finally we end up with the AM modulator, uh, which also doubles as the receiver and output tube. So multiple purpose tubes, beautifully designed set, uh, nicely packaged when it comes uh, from the uh, supply depot. And this is a rather unique version of the uh, BC-611. I, I don't really know the story behind it, but I found it at Nearfest in the original box that you see here. And I figured I was just buying a BC-611. I bought it, and I looked in this box, and by God, it said, made by Nippon Electric Company Limited in Tokyo, Japan. And that somehow just didn't sound right, but it was serial number, can you read it? 00001 to get serial number one of a Japanese-made BC-611F was an amazing thing. I still don't know the story. Do you have any idea what that might have been like? No, I really don't. Just, just one of the wonderful things about Nearfest is you can find things that are incredible here. Yeah. So here are some other pictures of it, and uh, it, it was a neat experience. So that's one of the things you can actually buy relatively easily at these shows, and uh, you can have one of these in your collection and they're very, very historic, fun to take apart, fun to operate. Most of them transmit and receive on 3885, which is the AM frequency for people these days, and that you can check in on those steps. Many of the World War II reenactments use radios, and the reenactors use BC-611, so they're typically on 3885, right in the middle of the 80 meter band, of course. One of the great books on spy radios, written by Louis Wielstein, and uh, Starlets, and, and it's a volume four, which deals specifically with clandestine radio. It's a wonderful book, very expensive, 65 bucks or so, but really, really worthwhile. It shows things like the British Type A Mark II spy radio that you see here. It shows the British spy radio Paraset. Now the Paraset was a spy radio like the suitcase radios, but it was built into a metal case that was designed to be dropped by parachute, and therefore it was more rugged. You can see that it used metal tubes instead of glass tubes to allow them to survive the fall, even though, of course, it was in a well-padded uh, container. And here's the famous British Spy Radio Type 3 B2. I would, I would be showing you one here, except that the Spy Museum in New York City really wanted one, and they paid me an awful lot of money for it. And so I'm having to show you pictures rather than the real thing at this point. The B2 has three different parts. The upper part that you see with the coil is the transmitter, and if you look to the right of the coil, you see the crystal for the uh, determining frequency. The lower part under that is the tunable receiver, and over on the right is the thing I was telling you about, humongous transformer inside that power supply on the right that makes the right side of the B2 just extremely, extremely heavy. And it's really hard, even for an adult male, to carry the suitcase without looking as though you're lugging lead around with you. It's modular. As you can see, the modules come apart easily. 
and uh, they can therefore be swapped out or repaired depending on what's convenient. Again, the circuit diagram is very, very simple. The transmitter has a crystal oscillator. On the left, you can see the crystal Y down there to the left of the oscillator too. It has a power amplifier too and feeds out into the antenna. There's a plug-in coil that you can see slightly to the right there. The receiver is very simple, has an RF amplifier and it feeds into the IF, the IF, um, intermediate frequency transformers um, and the converter feed out into the earphones. But the big problem is, look at that power supply. Look at all the windings on that transformer. That's the problem. That thing is really, really heavy. And uh, that was sort of a giveaway with all of the spy radio. This is a radio which is owned by Mike, I believe. Is it PRC1? Now you want to talk about your PRC1 a little bit? Well, actually, uh, yeah, that one's owned by uh, George Michael. Oh, okay. The one ANX. Okay. Uh, which sometimes does this for me, Nick Paul and myself. Uh, the one that I have is the same one that Mom has here, the PRC Fox. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Yeah. Okay, is it that, about this? Is that one that you have, Mike? No, I don't. Okay, there's a PRC one built into a, a metal case which enhanced its ability to survive parachute drops. The next slide shows the radio that I have up here, and I'm going to invite you to come and look at it more closely. It's a PRC-5, and Mike has one of these, and I was able to find this uh, at uh, a ham fest, and it's a very neat radio. As you can see, it has a telegraph key inside the lid, it has a power cord inside the lid, and uh, it's nicely set up. Uh, in terms of operation. The plug-in coils that you see allow it to operate in the 80 meter range or in the 40 meter range, approximately three to four megs and seven to eight megs. The um, controls on the front of it are fairly self-evident. The transmitter is up in the upper left-hand corner. The receiver is in the lower part here. If I had the time, I would demonstrate what a terrible receiver it has and what a great transmitter it has. The transmitter, beautiful crystal control, puts out about 30 watts with a 6L6 final, beautiful. The receiver is the touchiest, most horrible receiver you've ever heard. It has a BFO injection that's questionable. And as you turn the knob, which is the knob just beyond, below, and to the right of the meter there, you have to have a super steady hand on the knob or you go by the station and even then it's very, very difficult to uh, capture the station that you're trying to listen to. So it's, a, it's not a well-designed receiver. Here's the back view of the PRC-5. Again, it's modular. You have an upper part with, again, a 6L6 and a 6B6 in the transmitter stage and a bunch of metal tubes down in the receiver stage. The uh, uh, circuit diagram is very, very straightforward. You have a receiver, uh, RF amplifier in the upper left, a 455KC IF, a B frequency oscillator on the right, the transmitter, your 6B6 crystal oscillators on the lower left, the crystals visible in there under that tube somewhere. The 6L6 is a power amplifier and they all feed into the antenna. But the big problem is, look over on the right where it says power supply. Again, we have that huge power transformer. When you come up, just give a little lift on this thing and you'll see what I talk about when I say that the darn transformers are really, really heavy. This is another set. This is known as the SST-1. And the transmitter of this set, which I do have here, was designed so that it and the other components of the set could be built into a and baked into a loaf of bread. And so this is the transmitter, and you can come up and have a look at it. It has a little telegraph key, wonderful little telegraph key on the front, a crystal socket on the front, and um, a band switch that allows you to switch the coil in the back here. Uh, take a look at that, very interesting little set. Uh, there was one of these sets on sale down at the bottom of the hill uh, today when I walked down there, 
uh, for $200, and I paid $800 for this one. Oh, man, that hurts. <laughs> but I wasn't going to buy it because I know why I'm having two of these. But it's a very, very historic and important part of uh, World War II spy radio history. You can see over here how it looks. There's a loaf of bread with one of these baked into it. And uh, I don't know why they chose a loaf of bread, but apparently that's going to be less suspicious to the Germans. They figure it so They designed it that size. And there are three parts to this device. Um, the, um, let's see, I have this. Uh, yeah, here we go. Three, three parts to the device. It has, on the left here, you see the receiver. In the middle is the transmitter, and on the right is the power transformer, power supply, and again, that's very, very heavy. So, um, the other set, here's a picture of the SST-1 in operation. And uh, with that, I want to mention a really wonderful set of um, helpful clues and pieces of data that Mike put together for us. And then he put together this list of, of the designations of spy radio sets and indeed military sets, and so that we can recognize them. The BC, as in this BC 611 that I've been talking about, is a basic component. And uh, so if you have a transmitter, receiver, or even a small set, that's considered a basic component. I don't really understand why it's different from an SCR. Set complete radio. Do you have any idea, Mike? Yes. Okay. Well, I think the SCR will consist of several BCs. Uh, okay, so a set complete radio would consist of several BCs. Okay. So in World War II, then you're looking for names that say SCR or BC. Late in World War II, the designation PRC began to be used, and that stands for Portable radio communication. And so we have the PRC 6s and the PRC, uh, well, what was this one? PRC 5 and PRC 1 and so on. They still use the terminology yeah. today with the world of the YouTube. That's what it is. Yes, okay. Uh, not for mixed company. Not for mixed company. In uh, the 1950s, they added a few other designations. The TRC, Tactical Radio Communications Gear. GRC, Ground Radio Communications Gear. VRC, Vehicle Radio Communications Gear. And SYN CARS, Single Channel Ground and Airborne Radio System. And as you can imagine, it got more complicated after that. They love acronyms like that. Here is an RS-1, and I believe Mike has one of these complete sets. And this is a GRC, Ground Radio Communications, if you remember from back in that table, a GRC-109. And maybe Mike can walk us through the set by just pointing to the components up there. The, the, the GRC-109 essentially is a military version of the RS-1, RS-1. One is a term that was used by the three letter agency beginning with C and ending with A. They developed the radio in the 1950s, and the military liked it as a leave behind radio, which you could bury the ground and leave it for other people. So they made a couple of modifications to it. They added a port that you could use a high speed code here send CW bursts. And that's important because the DFing that they used to find spies took a little while to center in on where a radio was located, and a burst would be such a short transmission that they wouldn't have a chance to get a bearing. Right. And it would send out at, at 300 characters a minute, which is, and that's what they did with it. And the gear that was used to do that was the GRE-71. I'll tell you how rare those are. For, for many years, their radio sales, you all heard of their radio sales in Ohio? Yeah. How many people have heard of their radio sales? Well, some of you would. We used to get that catalog like twice a year. And how are you next? They had GRC-109 performance 
four to five years, and they were selling them for $100 for the whole set. And I told my friend, you know, you want to buy this thing because it's like they can use by radio, and it's cheap. But a lot of them didn't. Then after they ran out of receivers, everybody said, oh, I wanted to get those, but, you know. Anyway, they also had some RS1s and the component receiver transfer and power supply. One supplement came out, had the GRA 71 for 150 bucks. As soon as I got it, I picked up the phone, they were all gone. They went like that. And I got one in another way, but it took some doing to get it, and it works. And one of these shows when I don't have to be working, I'd like to bring one and show you how it works, but unfortunately this one, I'm not in the middle of some stuff that's going on right now. And I got to get back to I promise to help you get your stuff back to your I can, I can do that. So I get a couple of guys to volunteer to help Tom get his stuff back to his table. Thanks. Okay, there's another picture of the set. I'll just look at through this as quick as I can. Stay for another second. There's GRC 109. GRC 109 is the transmitter section. Talk about the RS6 for a second. Sure, the RS6. Radio station number six was actually built as a survival radio station for RB 47 troops that were over flying the edges of the Soviet Union. They came in a vest, it was a very bulky vest, but still it could be worn by the air crew that if they were to be shot down, they have a radio that they could use. It's essentially a miniaturized version of the RS 1, but it had four pieces. It had power supply and also the voltage regulator. I'm sorry. It, uh, it was worn in the vest you know, for four pieces. They worked on 12 volts, 24 volts, 110, and 240 AC. And uh, they were around. Uh, they were worth about $1,000, $1,500 on these. There was a GRC 109. Out at the same place where they had an RS. I didn't see it. It's just amazing. Uh, very reasonable, maybe 400 bucks. Yeah, that's reasonable today. But here's the RS6 transmitter. You can see a little telegraph piece yeah, the out there. Up. And uh, there's the receiver for the RS6. Yeah. You can look up at the screen. That uses these, uh, they're called pencil tubes. They solder in, but they're, they're tubes that are like a the receiver uses, uh, as, so, as does the RS-1 or the DRC-109, it uses a, a 2E26, which is basically a miniature 6140, 6150. Just about 15 watts up, which is, you know, plenty. And here's the power supply, and again, it's in the wheel cap. Yeah. Look at the, all the voltages that it'll operate on down there on the right. Um, Mike, I, need, I know you need to go, but just talk about your Delco 5300. Delco was made by the same people who made the Delco car radios for General Motors. Delco is owned by General Motors. It's a solid state, you know, and it was used in the, in the 60s. They had a military version of it called the DRC 64. Great little CW radio, it also does AM. And uh, they have a column mechanical filter, nice little radio. You find them now. It was about 500. 500? Yeah. And there it is in its case. Yeah, with the case is harder to find. And then there it is with its little internal telegraph key. And here it is uh, with the case off. You can see the, the electrical components. Uh, just quickly finishing up, we have a number of experimental spy radios. This was a scuba radio that people designed. And I got to go on. Yeah, I know you got to run. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing for us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. A little applause for us. We love you all. We wouldn't be here without him. He really rescued this hand fest many years ago. Got a great team of people and put them together and just keeps things going beautifully. So this is uh, one of the crazy attempts at the 
uh, various kinds of spy radio. This was a scuba radio that you know, could sort of pop up. I don't know quite what you did for an antenna, maybe you floated it on the top of the water or something like that. Obviously, it never caught on. Uh, none have ever actually been seen other than this one picture. And here's another one. This is a doggy uh, radio that's sort of interesting. You'll notice that the dog has an earphone and a microphone. And you've got to wonder about that. And you, can, you can imagine the, the handler of the dog speaking into his microphone, and the dog hears it, but, but the dog speaking into its microphone <laughs> to the handler? Woof, woof, what's going on? <laughs> I cannot figure out how that worked, but anyway, that's kind of fun. I want to end up with a really exciting radio, the Harris RF310M. This is the radio of today. Every picture you see of anybody in Afghanistan, every picture you see of the presidential security forces, every picture you see of anything military at all uses this Harris um, RF310. It is the equivalent of not only a radio, but an Enigma machine. In the back of the radio is an encoding device that encodes the voice messages and makes it into a highly secure and coded communication device. And it's just incredibly difficult to find. I happened to find this one. Uh, a, a tank driver was driving by me in a World War II reenactment in Reading, Pennsylvania. They do real reenactments. And he had this radio and he said, Tom, I need a World War II radio. I don't want this one. And I said, well, I've got a BC-611. Would you be interested in uh, a trade? And he said, sure. Give me the BC-611. I'll give you this radio. Well, these radios are impossible to buy, literally impossible. I did hear of one being sold for 4000 bucks, And I don't know what Harris charges for it. Anyone know? They're very, very, very expensive. They were like 15000 Fifteen thousand? Wow. How did he get? Yeah, no, how did he get? Well, I wasn't going to ask him. It sounds like it's a shovel like that. Anyway, this thing has been fantastic. You can tune it up on two meters. You, you can uh, make it operate like a ham radio. And if you have the right key, you can make it into an enigma. So it's a really, really amazing thing. Take a close look at it. I thought, man, I was really, really lucky to get this thing. Really lucky. I, I've never seen another one as long as I live, probably. And then, all of a sudden, I'm looking at eBay. Holy mackerel! $297, what is this going on? I'm looking at these sets. Look at those things. They all say Harris on them. And the description says, new U.S. stock upgraded, try ANPRC-152. We were just talking about PRCs, right? Portable radio communication. It's got to be a military radio. And then you look further and you, you click on these things and you say, you know, that's very strange. It, it's being shipped from China? How can that be? So what is going on? Anybody know what's going on? The only thing I can imagine is that the Chinese have literally copied the radio, the Harris radio. They even put Harris up at the top. Go ahead, tell us. I walked one on eBay. Yeah. And it's a clone, but it runs. I couldn't figure out the company that manufactured it. It's essentially a two-meter uh, analog radio stuck in the exact copy of the case. Oh, and and the, the lettering, the lettering Harris even matches, right? They're built aluminum. Uh, they run on the big batteries. I don't know the number. Yeah. But, but I sold one here at the other building. The company was back for like, I think I got 400 dollars. Yeah. I paid like 300. Absolutely, I cannot They're understand this. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you know these radios contain the crypto key? No. no, no crypto anything. No, it's basically it's basically a bail phone or whatever it is nice. stuck into. A <laughs> <case>. <laughs> but I think it's absolutely fascinating 
that, that the Chinese have copied this incredibly complex and expensive radio, and they're selling them for a few hundred dollars. It just blows my mind. I, I don't know how to understand it. Yeah, go ahead. Is the one on your table about also Mill Luma? Uh, I will have. Come up and take a look in a minute when I finish up here. Thank you. In any event, that, that's pretty much what I had to talk to you about. <laughs> uh, a lot of work you taught me on the side and the only on the right, and uh, I hope you found it interesting. Please come up. I, I forgot to talk about this. This is <clears throat> the radio that the Navajo code talkers used during World War II, and um, I'm going to open it up. I've got a, a problem with my back, so I can't really lift anything like that. I'll put it up on the table here for you to look at. And it's a kind of fun little little radio that uh, <coughs> that has um, acorn tubes in it. And you can see the construction of a typical uh, World War II radio. Oh. Uh, somebody can tell flips open if you look in at the at the components that are these wonderful little acorn tubes that uh, that are inside it and the tube things. So that's that's the typical radio that the code talkers use. And this is the PRC5, which is a classic suitcase spy radio. It's supposed to look like an innocent suitcase. And come up and take a look at that. The um, SSR1 is interesting because uh, they're all typical two components, nothing miniaturized, and yet it still produces inside a loaf of bread. And um, the, um, the two walkie talkies over here. So, thank you for your attention and your patience, and uh, thank Mike for coming and joining us. And just go and ask questions or poke around. Did anybody have any questions? Yeah. The um, five people you know, the ones that are out from parachute, do they have the all kind of neutral? Do they have to understand German and French and other people? No, they didn't have to, but typically when they were parachuted into a country, they would want to understand some of the language of the country where they uh, parachuted into, but they didn't really have to. They had to train radio operators very quickly for World War II. And so they parachuted some operators into uh, into Europe uh, without adequate language training. The main thing was that they send and receive more as code. So that, that was the main thing. You know, but they just had to crank them out too fast. Any other questions? Yeah. That book series that you mentioned is a free and work. It's it, it, uh, wireless and warriors? Or? Wireless uh, for the warrior, I think. Oh, it's used the M E U L S T E E. And there are many different belt volumes there. Big radio sets and little radio sets, and he also has um, spy radios from all different countries. So you'll see what the Russian spy radios look like, and so on. It's a, it's a real, really good compendium of spy radio stuff. He may have a website also. I seem to remember that he might. Wow. A neat guy. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks for attending. Yeah. <laughs> Was I in the service? No, I was not, but I love spy radio. It's been an amazing You said the Chinese copied the Harris radio, but they're selling it as just a stripped down VHF radio. Yeah, right. But they made the case so. That was what they wrote. Yeah, it's so funny, I guess. How can it be worth their while to make a. It's a fairly complex thing to copy. <laughs> this is not a copy. This is the real thing, and they did a good copy. Yeah. Yeah.